2 plus 2i over 4. That's an Unreal Time Signature, and it's what you're listening to right now. This background beat is actually from a video I made on this topic about a year ago, and I'll be straight with you, that video was... not perfect. I kind of figured out things as I filmed, and because of that I left out a lot of big concepts and made things muddier than they needed to be. Now this video is not a remake, we will be getting into new stuff, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. But quickly, let's recap. This whole operation of inputting new types of numbers into time signatures is really an instance of function generalization. For any function, there's going to be a scope or a domain. That's the set of all possible inputs for the function. For time signatures, the domain is positive real numbers. It's important to remember that time signatures are not a real element of the universe. They're just symbolic tools for people to use to make music. And so their definition is based on consensus, not analysis. It's just people figuring out what's useful and interesting over the course of history. Now, what I'm really trying to do by putting complex numbers in time signatures is generalizing the time signature function. Time signatures are already well defined within the domain of positive real numbers, so then I'm trying to figure out how we might define time signatures for inputs outside of that original domain, such that we still have something useful and interesting. That's a bit dense, but what it means for us is that if we're to create a generalized system for time signatures that can take complex numbers, when we input normal real numbers, we should still get the same correct thing that we would have before. A 4-4 measure should look exactly the same in our new system as it does normally. But outside of that domain of positive real numbers, we can actually do whatever we'd like and still call it a time signature because it still fits the definition. This is a crucial point because it reveals we have options. It reveals that there are multiple ways to validly generalize time signatures, so long as the original domain remains the same. Last year I went with the map and fill model of expressing time signatures with complex numbers. My system said to take the absolute value of the top number and map out the starting point of each measure by going in the positive direction on the real axis. Then go back and fill in each measure essentially as a vector. As you can see, this resulted in a time plot where the measures were disconnected, which I found really cool. Now notice how applying this with real number time signatures works exactly as it should. This is how we know it's still a valid time signature system. In order to actually perceive these measures, I took their shadows on the real axis. Another model that I could have used but dismissed early on because I found it less interesting was the append model. This one's a lot more intuitive. You just draw a measure, start at the end of that one, and draw the next measure, on and on. In technical terms, this means just adding the vectors together, as it turns out. But this one's less interesting until you start using negative numbers, but we'll get to that in a bit. What I really want to look at today hey. mainly is... What about the bottom number? Ah yes, the bottom number. So yeah, it doesn't actually really matter for our purposes today. The bottom number, technically speaking, really just denotes a font in musical engraving. I mean, there is a practical function of the bottom number in time signatures, which you can learn about in my video on big time signatures there. But for our purposes today, yeah, the bottom number really doesn't matter at all. Does that satisfy you? No, that's dumb. Well, you're dumb. Can we start a band? No. What I actually want to do today is two things. First, I want to try to synthesize what exactly it means to have a complex number in a time signature and what I really meant the first time that I did that a year ago. And second, I want to experiment with time plots, the append model, and having complex time signatures where the real component is negative. Except, point one, it's not really about complex numbers. In the description of last year's video, I joked that I would come back the next year with quaternion time signatures. Now at the time, I didn't really know anything about quaternions other than that they were an extension of the complex numbers, but really what I was doing with complex numbers had nothing to do particularly with complex numbers. It was simply about two-dimensional time vectors. Complex numbers are an easy way of representing 2D vectors, but there's nothing special, in our case, about using imaginary numbers to represent that. And in fact, any number of dimensions that I decide I want to use for my measures are just going to give me the same kind of thing because ultimately we have to take the shadow back down to one dimension so we can actually perceive it. And that means that the only thing we get is speeding up and slowing down at various rates and if we use some sort of map and fill model we get pauses. But none of that is going to really be qualitatively different for three or four or any number of dimensions compared to two. But there's lots of interesting things to do with two-dimensional time plots. 
An interesting way to think about this is that we are creating a theoretical song for higher dimensional beings that perceive two dimensions of time, and then we take the shadow of that song into our one dimension of time to perceive and enjoy it ourselves. Uh, for instance, one thing you could make for our perception based on this higher dimension song is a simple polyrhythm like this. First we have a 4-4 four, four measure, which plays normally, and then we have this minus 4 plus 3i measure, which could be represented with any kind of 2D vector notation, but complex numbers work great for that, so we're still going to use them. Anyway, we need to figure out how many beats are played in that minus 4 plus 3i measure, and it turns out to be 5, that's the absolute value of minus 4 plus 3i. Because it's shadow, its real component is only 4 long, and that overlaps the first measure because of the negative sign, what we're going to hear is the most literal possible polymeter, and, with just a metronome click, a polyrhythm. So that's cool, but we didn't need to go into two dimensions of time to get a 5 over 4 polyrhythm, so what are we even doing here? Well, remember that 2 plus 2i beat at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, that was in 2 plus 2i, I guess, but it sounds like it's in 4-4, four, four, and we could have easily just made it in 4-4 four, four and gotten the same product. But I would have never actually made that if I hadn't have been investigating what complex time signatures might be. And this is the point, is just to investigate and to have fun with weird ideas in music. This is not about practicality, it's not even about getting some sort of sound that is new that you couldn't hear any other way. It's just about having fun with weird music ideas. So, what if we make a crazy time plot like this? This uses the append model, as you can see, and it actually starts earlier than zero, but that's okay. Written in musical notation, it's going to look like this, which is quite something. To construct this song in FL Studio, I'm going to make the audible number of beats in each measure a rational approximation of the absolute value of each measure's complex time. In other words, the length of the vector based on the units of a quarter note is in fact going to be how many beats there are. Then I will speed them up for perception based on dividing their absolute value by their real component. For instance, minus 4 plus 3i would have an absolute value of 5, meaning 5 beats played in that measure. Then I would speed it up by a factor of 5 over negative 4, or minus minus 125%, so that it lines up properly as a shadow of the time plot. In practice, that'll be increasing the tempo by 25%, exporting and reversing. So first we make the rational approximations for the beats of each measure. FL does not make this easy, but what I've decided to do is just make the project with a really high tempo and 32 beats per measure, so I can get pretty close. Next we'll actually put some music into this. And now it's all about processing. What you see me doing here is exporting each pattern for each time signature, then in Audacity I speed it up by the appropriate amount, and then I can take it back to FL, where I will cut, reverse, and arrange them all accordingly. So here we are, the final product, a crazed mess of a time plot, and yeah, it pretty much sounds like that, uh, but you know, there are parts that I don't like. I like that, but then there are also things that I do like, like check this loop out. Like, that sounds really cool to me. And then if we uh, take this away right here, and mute this track and play this... That is a really cool sound to me, that like kind of transition. It's like the pitches are sliding, but they're not actually... Anyway, I really like that sound, so there are definitely some cool things coming out of this. Uh, but yeah, as a whole, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but you never know what's going to come out of it, that's the fun of it. Lastly, what I think I want to do with this two-dimensional time plot device is just something that doesn't really have a strict connection to what we've done so far, but it just seems like a fun idea, which is to take a song um, that's just a normal song, so you have vectors extending on the positive real axis, just, you know, one after another, and then rolling that song up. So taking the measures and then just like rolling them up into some sort of shape should be a lot of fun. Let's try it out. So, here's a little example with a triangle. The triangle is obviously made of three vectors, so we'll need three measures from whatever song we're using. I'm going to use my 2 plus 2 I beat, treating it as 4-4 four, four because it's so close. See, 4-4 four, four metronome at this particular tempo works great. We're going to need three measures, so let's chop off everything else. Assuming our first measure is the bottom vector, we can see that the next two are going to need to be reversed and made two times as fast, since that's what their shadows both do. So let's do that real quick. We're going to chop these up. We're going to make them unique as sample. 
One interesting thing I can do while I'm stretching and reversing all these clips is actually arrange them in the playlist such that they kind of form the shape of the triangle like that. So you see how that kind of echoes the shape of the triangle. Bop, bop, bop. Anyway, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> I think that sounds pretty cool. Now notice how this is not a time signature system that we're dealing with anymore. This is why I said it's kind of disconnected from what we did before, but it's still fun and it kind of draws from this idea of the two-dimensional time plot. But unlike the append or map and fill model of time signatures, this has nothing to do with creating measures, simply manipulating them, and it also isn't strictly involved with two dimensions. I'd probably call this method something like the cascading rescale, but really what it boils down to is just rescaling the measures and making sure they remain linked, meaning that the ending of one measure, as we see here, is connected to the beginning of the next measure, and that the same measures are linked in the result as they were when it was flat. But this can be done in only one dimension. Here I've stretched the measures out a little bit so the arrowheads won't overlap when I do this, but watch how I can do that whole transformation and get the same product without going into two dimensions. Now again, this is rescaled from what we just saw, but it's the same effect. Doing this to our three measures would have resulted in exactly the same sound, but we didn't need to go into two dimensions. So what that two-dimensional device, that curling function really is, is just a creative tool, but it's still fun, and it's spooky season. So, you know, um, <laughs> it's interesting, it's, uh, it's a little messy, but I have a feeling that really what I'm gonna get out of this is, is small nuggets of things that, that sound kinda cool. Maybe there's something there, I don't know, um, but it's a lot of fun anyway. I've mentioned it a couple times in this video already, but I want to hammer home what this is all about, right? I started a year ago thinking about what complex numbers might mean if you put them into time signatures. What does that look like? What does that sound like? And from there, it developed to this point where now I have this idea of a two-dimensional time that is mapped back on. It really has nothing to do with complex numbers in particular, but what we ended up with was something that I think is pretty fun, pretty cool, and actually results in some good sounds that I might use later to make music that maybe actually has some emotional meaning or something like that. But the point is, it was fun along the way. And maybe the mathy stuff wasn't as appealing to you, but the sounds were kind of cool, or maybe the sounds weren't appealing, but the math was cool. If neither, then it's not for you, I guess, but then you're probably not watching this clip. So, that's what it's about. It's about having fun. This is not about practicality. This is not about making money, but it's here. So, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the spooky time plots and the crazy time plots and whatnot. Um, and I hope you'll join me next video for whatever else I come up with. And yeah, thanks for watching.